Julie Kirkland with Arts and Medicine, and this is Virtual Mental Health Monday, where we engage um, the arts to explore issues that affect our mental health. Um, the music that you heard was created by one of our guests, Renee Soul. So thank you, Renee, for that. Uh, and if you have questions of our guests, please put them in uh, the chat box below and we'll get to those at the end. Also, please note that this is being recorded. So if you do not want your face being recorded on this, please turn off your camera. And, um, and then this evening's topic is racial healing. And it was inspired by some work the AIM team has been doing since March around the same subject, Selam Green, poet, educator, community healer, entrepreneur, and AIM artist in residence has been leading us in this work. And I wanted to uh, continue to explore that uh, through, through the arts here. And she has brought together a really talented and accomplished um, group of guests this evening. So we have Ashley M. Jones, poet, uh, an educator, and Renee Stuhl, entrepreneur, DJ, beat maker, and uh, producer. Uh, so welcome, Ashley and Renee, and Salam. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Salam. And uh, we would love to just start out by hearing from each of you uh, about your creative projects, your creative practice, and um, anything else that you want to share. So thank you so much for being here. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for being here. And I really am excited for you to hear from all of our wonderful artists who you probably already know in the community who, even as of today, has just put out some great stuff that I'm like, okay, yes, you know, we have some new, exciting, international, global poets and beat maker and uh, just everything that's happening, I think it's just very, very timely. So I'm just excited to be here and to be here in kind of a uh, liberated space. Uh, my creative practice, I'm a poet, um, educator, artist in residence with um, AIM Arts and Medicine at UAB and in several other spaces. I'm very grateful uh, to be called on to do this work even when I am unable sometimes to even um, do my own practice for myself. <laughs> I'm able to be called on to do that. And so um, that's what I do in the community. I have a literary healing arts business, help people heal through writing. Also, um, spoken word, anything else that people can call upon me to do as far as social justice or reimagining justice and those kinds of things. But my favorite thing to do is to collaborate with Black women and to do the work with um, that we have been called to do, which is liberation work, which I believe we'll be kind of doing today. And I'm really excited for you to hear from them and not myself, but really I'm excited about the things that they're doing in the world. So that's me and Ashley. <laughs> thank you, Salem. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. And seriously, thank you, Salem, for asking me to do this. Um, I'm really excited to be in conversation with you and with, um, I guess I shouldn't call you Sean because this is a public <laughs> forum, but with uh, Renee Soul. We call you by your name, <laughs> by your government name or by your, okay. Whatever makes you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here with Sean and Selam um, today to share work. Um, as far as my creative practice, I am a poet. I'm trying to be a nonfiction writer at the moment, um, but I'm a poet. <laughs> um, and I'm also an educator. I teach at the Alabama School of Fine Arts and also at UAB. Um, and I run the Magic City Poetry Festival as well. Um, so I do a little bit of everything and at the core of my work, it's very similar to Salam, is liberation minded. Um, I truly believe that everyone um, on planet Earth has some skill that they can use to help the world become a better place and I choose to use my art to do that. Um, so any kind of activism that I do usually is linked um, very closely to my writing. Um, and so we probably will get into that a little bit today um, during our discussion. So that's me. Hey everyone, I am Renee So, um, also known as Sean. <laughs> um, Ceylon, thank you once again for um, having me um, to be a part of the panel. Um, thank you, AIM, for having me um, being a part of the panel. I'm so glad to be here with, with all of you and Ashley, all of you. Um, it's good to see some faces I hadn't seen in a while. I miss you. 
Um, so yeah, uh, about me, I am Renee So. I'm a producer. I'm a beat maker. Um, I'm, a also, I'm also a DJ. I'm an artist educator. Um, and I also founded an organization called the Initiative for Creative Arts. Um, and with that organization, uh, we use music technology um, and hip hop to uh, teach kids how to be free, really, and how to express themselves and also use that, use their skills, whether it's emceeing, whether it's you know writing rhymes or poetry, whether it's learning how to engineer their music or learning how to incorporate how they feel into sound, you know, we use that to teach them. Like um, Ceylon was, was talking about liberation work, and it's definitely that, it's freedom. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I've also traveled around and, and talk, um, taught music workshops specifically towards women, um, because, you know, in this field, uh, not a lot of women are getting the dues that they should get in music production and engineering. And so I spent a lot of time um, teaching young women and girls how to produce music, how to DJ, um, and, and basically how to use it to um, amplify their voice um, and change their community or communities or their world. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much me. Yeah. Well, Thank you guys so much. Um, I would love, I think everybody would love to hear some of your work, uh, if you're ready to share that. Uh, Salam, are you going to share with us? Yes, I'll go, and I guess we'll just go in round. So um, I, I wanted to share a piece that's from um, Kimberly James. And Kimberly James uh, is an author of a book called Finding My Brave Space. And... Um, she talks about in 2017 how she went on her own personal journey and her personal journey was um, to go to Africa. And she talked about being on a plane and flying uh, to Ghana and being in a space where there was all black folk and how she felt so excited and so liberated, but at the same time felt inspired um, to write a poem. And the name of the poem that she wrote is called The Point the center and the norm. So even though this isn't my own piece, it, it inspires me tonight to think about the work that we have to do and the work that other people are doing in these spaces. It feels good to be here on this plane filled with black people of all shades, hair, textures, and styles. People speaking different languages, filling economy, business, first class, friends, families, couples, kids, laughing, working, reading, sleeping, being, the point, the center, the norm. My heart swells with joy because it is not often that I am the point, the center, the norm. If you're white in America and much of the world, really, you're used to being the point, the center, the norm. What was it like to grow up being the point, the center, the norm? To not be the only one on your street or in your class. To not have a teacher equate your skin tone with the lack of intelligence. To not feel the sizzle of a hot comb or the burn of chemicals so your hair can meet a standard of beauty. To not have rules that won't allow you to wear your hair the way it naturally grows out of your head. To have the powers that be say banning locks and braids is not against the law because they go against the point, the center, the norm. To not be regarded as dangerous, criminal, or angry. But don't we have the right to be angry? Look how quickly you get angry when you're asked to make space for others in the point, the center, the norm. Cries, all lives matter, reverse racism, make America great again. When was it great for me? When black people were held in bondage and sold like property? When Jim Crow ruled the land, terrorized families, and strange fruit hung from a tree? When separate was anything but equal and we needed a green book to travel safely? When police brutalize black bodies at will and then get acquitted? When standing up for your rights gets you hosed, fired, assassinated? When we're told that it's not the right time to speak out against injustice? It's not the right way or the right time. The point, the center, the norm. If you're Black in America and much of the world, really, it's an unfamiliar place. You're used to being located outside of the point, 
the center, the norm. Your skin tone and hair judged by a standard that doesn't fit you. The way you speak and move through the world degraded, mocked, villainized because it does not originate from the point, the center, the norm. How was it decided? The point, the center, the norm. Who said one way was the way? The point, the center, the norm. I see now the threat of having the point, the center, the norm challenged. It, uh, it's a powerful position to be in. It's comfortable, it's safe, it's privileged. Mm, on this plane, I like being the point, the center, the norm. Many people ask me why Africa? I could talk about the variety of cultures, nature, or the historic sites, but I have a simple answer. For a little while, I get to breathe free and be the point, the center, the norm. Thank you. Look her up. She's awesome. <laughs> I think Miss A. Yes, I am next. That was amazing, Salam. I know that wasn't your poem, but you really performed that beautifully. Um, and it's so interesting how these things always align. Laura um, Secord, who's here with us, would always say that the, um, the universe aligns things perfectly without us trying to. And so the poem that I'm going to read in this round um, sort of talks about that same idea of not being the point, the center, or the norm as a Black woman. So this piece that I will read to you um, is a golden shovel. So Dana, I know you're listening, but another golden shovel is here. Um, and that's a specific form, which if anybody has um, questions about that, you can ask me or you can drop it in the chat and I can scurry and type it um, while I'm not speaking. Um, but this poem was the result of um, a commission from a book called Southern Women, which came out, I think, in 2018. Time doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So at some point in the past, this book um, came out. And um, the editor asked me to respond to the question, what does it mean to be a Southern woman? And so the first thing I thought of was, well, I'm not just a Southern woman, I'm a black woman too. And that um, identity really matters a lot. So I decided to write this piece um, inspired by that question. And the Golden Shovel um, orig origin poem is called Black Women by Lucille Clifton. So my poem is called, I cannot talk about the South without talking about black women. My grandmothers made America, made the fibers that made us warm, made us invincible, heroines. To tell you who they are, I must start with who they are not. Servants, kitchen-bound mammies, silently obedient wives, we can't, in our modern comforts, imagine the survival they learned was theirs to claim. Can't hold the light they burned through this colonial darkness. What tricks this nation, this American South pulled, minute by minute, to keep my grandmothers convinced. The body you're in is not enough. Your race and your gender work together to mark you less, to mark you takeable. But what they didn't know was that my grandmothers still had an unmovable strength, enough to build a bridge from here to heaven. I know when I leave this broken earth, I'll find them there, sweetening every hour. My grandmothers raised a generation of American men. There is no other way to say this. Look at any Southern family and you'll find somewhere in a past most will not claim, a black woman. These men who call themselves bootstrapping and self-made, somewhere there's a black woman and her unthanked hands who lifted them to where they are now. My father tells a story of the sons of his grandmother's employers, how they, instead of the pension she was promised, decided to give her a damned old tire, an old suitcase, dusty in the yard. What thanks is this for the years she raised that family, for the care they cannot forget? My father could never forgive those men. 
their Southern tradition, their American tradition. Even now, they tell us black women are going to save this whole nation with votes or magic or our style taken and renamed. But this is no longer the land of masses and mammies and we are only superheroines for our own daughters and sons. My grandmothers did not give their lives for me to keep nursing this country, to keep shucking and jiving in a bizarro American dream. My grandmothers are worth more than this corrupt remembering. Now there is no room for the Dixieland lie. We no longer hold these truths you made us accept. Under God, yes. We hear him singing a song of powerful love despite the united hate of America. Grandmothers, women made of salt and spirit, you are faith, continuous. Continue us, raise us to be heroes and heroines, to tell this country that we are not mules, not beasts. You, an army of workers and wives, we hid our fears and woes in your indestructible, ever-present ladiness. The blood you pass down to us is all we will ever need to save our lives. Thank you. Um, wow, uh, that was great, Ceylon and, and Ashley. And you're right, it's always interesting how things um, always align. Um, I'm, I'm a little different. I think. I used to be, I, well, I, I get caught up every time I say this, but I used to be a poet. <clears throat> I used to write poetry, to do spoken word. I just found another way of doing it, and I do it through sound. Um, and I also use, you know, the sounds that I uh, curate as a way to kind of speak to um, how I'm feeling and, how, and what I'm doing. Um, there may be some times where there are certain things that are happening. Um, in the community or in the world, and I'm feeling somewhere about it and can't really um, express it verbally. So I always find the sounds or I create the sounds that will express it uh, for me. Um, this one um, track that I'm going to play, I'm just going to play a little bit of it. Um, it was inspired by um, Pat Parker. Um, if you don't know who Pat Parker is, Please make sure that you look up Pat Parker. She's a poet, an activist, um, a civil rights leader, um, a queer rights leader. Um, she's done so many things. And so um, a great, great friend of mine, Dr. Shamara Kwachi, asked me to um, take parts of uh, some uh, parts, parts of her, where will you be, um, and put it in a track so that she can she can do her spoken word over it. And so that's sometimes it's kind of challenging because, you know, when you are doing some things like that, you want to make sure that is right and that is fitting for the poet or for the writer so they can do their part over it. And so as I started to look up Pat Park and, and, and go back and look at her work, one of my favorite pieces by her is called Questions. Um, so make sure you, you look, up, look, at, look that up as well. Um, so what I did was I, I read that poem and I, I listened to the words of my great friend, Dr. Shamara Kwachi, and uh, put this together. And so I'm gonna play play some, some of it for you. Just a moment, let me get it. <clears throat> Actually, it's not, okay. We're gonna have to come back to that one. I'll play, I'll play another one, hold on. Let me know if you can hear this. It still applies, but... Thank you. 
Thank you, Renee and, and Ashley and Sulam. Those were really powerful pieces um, that you shared. I, um, I want to ask a couple questions and then um, I want to make sure we get to hear from you again. So, um, of course, an hour is not anywhere near enough time to really, you know, um, talk. So we might have to do this again. But, um, but I wanted to see if each of you would just share um, a little bit about um, kind of your own journey with healing, um, what racial healing means to you and how um, either that comes out in your work or kind of that relationship between uh, your own personal healing and, and your art, whichever, um, whatever type of art that is. So I'll just start with Salam if you want to uh, share. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you for that, um, everyone. Um, beautiful offerings to the world to open up. Um, my own journey, of course, with, with racial healing and um, just in healing in general, I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for poetry, writing, music, art in and of itself. Um, personally, myself, um, you know, even currently with so many things that I have, um, I'm challenged with, but, um, I think all of my work is centered around <laughs> liberation, like we talked about, uh, before, but I really like to channel Alice Walker, someone who, who I, I just, a pioneer of, <sighs> gender justice, a pioneer of justice and liberation for black women and, and black folks who talks um, a lot about that. It's up to us to heal ourselves. It's up to us to complete that circle. It's up to us to, uh, as black folks and, and as a community to bring those communities together. And so that's what I think my creative practice is, even though I, I really strongly uh, refer to working with women and using healing as a tool and uh, using my personal experiences kind of as a catapult to towards how um, I look at the world. I really look towards uh, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, uh, women who have written and who have uh, been the um, sojourners for justice and for truth. And I believe truth telling is number one. So that's what I try to do with my work. It, tell stories, tell poetry, tell, uh, tell writing through truth telling. How I see it and how I was treated. I've experienced, experienced racism, I mean, yeah, every day probably, uh, covert or overt, and have also experienced very overt si situations and circumstances that has led me to go and just write about it and put it out there in the public to allow the public to, to see it uh, on display. I believe that it's very important that we uh, cultivate those brave spaces to do that. So that's what I try to do with, with the, my uh, essays I write, nonfiction, also with poetry. For me, it's a lot of my own personal experiences. I am a, I'm not a classically trained poet. Um, I I haven't gone to school to do this. I don't have a uh, background in understanding all of the uh, mores of how 
uh, the English literature and the English language puts itself together. But I believe I have a calling to understand how we think as people and how my personal experiences can help other folks. And so that's what I do with poetry and uh, writing and those kinds of things. And um, also using my own personal mental health issues I've gone through, um, struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder right now and other types of things. And it's, you know, how as a black woman, we go into these spaces with these different challenges and um, maybe we can't talk about it, but I certainly can write about it and use poetry, rhythm and rhyme, as well as art to um, help express myself or expressive writing to do that. We can go and write. Um, I guess I'm gonna jump in um, to follow the order that we shared in. Um, first, I'll just say, Salam, um, classical training is often overrated. You are a poet in every sense of the word. <laughs> um, you know, we all come to poetry in different ways. And, you know, something that I truly am trying to change in the world is this idea that um, there's only one way to be a certain thing. For too long, academic poets and non-academic poets, I guess, have been at odds or one has seen one in a certain way and the other has seen another in another way. And if there's only one thing I can do in the world before I leave is just to show people that we all are doing the thing, you know, um, together. Um, and that poetry and all art is really much deeper than any academic pursuit. If you're not doing it for your livelihood, for to survive, then I don't know if you're really doing it, you know? Um, but that's a soapbox that I didn't need to get on. So let me step off that um, and answer the question. Um, so for me, I think too often we um, expect racial healing to be a kumbaya, immediate, like, oh, here we are together, we don't see color kind of moment. And in my life and in my practice as a poet and as an educator, um, I am trying to show people that healing has stages. And a lot of those stages are very ugly and uncomfortable. And all of them, except for maybe the final stage of here we are healing together, is an internal act. Um, even if you are listening to us speak or if you read lots of books, um, the healing and the um, reconciliation has to come from within. So it's not a situation where I, let's say, I, I'm a black woman, um, it, it is not enough for me to explain to you how racism feels. Everyone has to go the next step and apply it to their lives. Um, and um, take stock of what you do, what you say, biases that you have or don't have. Um, and that's when the healing can really begin. So in my work, I don't shy away from um, uncomfortable situations or phrases or images. Um, and it's not to make people you know, sad necessarily, it's just to show the truth, just like Salam said, um, to show the truth without trying to make people comfortable because if I'm honest, I'm not comfortable all the time um, because people make me very uncomfortable um, by asking me certain questions or assuming certain things about me or saying things to me that are very offensive um, or, you know, making a spectacle out of my hair, my skin. You know, there's a lot of ways that I'm moving in discomfort. So if, if you're feeling discomfort, just listen to the poem. Imagine how much discomfort there is to live that experience. Um, so that's the thing that I try to drive home is just be aware that healing is not always pretty. In fact, usually it is not. Um, but that doesn't mean that good work isn't happening because at the end, there will be something very beautiful where people are able to feel empathy toward each other um, from every side. Um, and we will be able to live here on earth together without all of these problems. That goes for the same for me. Um, both of you summed it up pretty, you know, beautifully. Um, and we're on the same page with that. I, you know, I think about how I use my art, um, music production, beat making, DJing um, for, you know, racial healing. Like you said, healing is in stages. Um, one of the things, though, for me is when, you know, we talk about healing and, um, and racial healing and racial justice, that it's okay, like for a lot of the youth that I work with, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be vulnerable. Um, and it's okay to express that. It's okay to, you know, be open. It's okay to be honest. And it's okay to create dialogue where that you can have communication um, 
and dialogue about how you feel. Um, for because for me, um, if you're open and if you have these dialogues and if you you know are saying, hey, this I don't like and I'm going to do something about it, it's okay. And so because a lot of times we think you know, especially I, I work with a lot of youth and they really have been conditioned um, to think that, that, that they don't have a voice, um, that they don't have power. But as we've been seeing over the last few months, that's not true. And so, you know, showing them these images. So I, I recently did a workshop um, with some youth that I work with. We were talking about using art to communicate um, social justice. So whether it was poetry, photography, music, graffiti, and, you know, I had them look at the images that they were seeing and to tell me, what are you seeing and, and what, how does this make you feel? And so we had great dialogue about that and great conversation about that things that they never really thought about. And so for me, in order to heal, I, I think communication is, is really key. I can echo all day what Ceylon and Ashley said, but, you know, I think about many times that, you know, you know, we are oppressed uh, or our voices are uh, are uh, suppressed. Um, and so I think it's very important to to yell it, scream it out. Um, and, and you can use your art to do that. And it's OK. And so that's what I like to teach through my work, that it's OK to feel what you're feeling right. If you're uncomfortable, OK, that's that's fine. It's, it's not going to be comfortable. Um, and you don't have to make other people comfortable as well. Um, and so. You know, use your art as I, you know, try to encourage them, encourage you then along with myself, because sometimes, you know, I have my moments. <laughs> um, um, but using your, you know, your 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 art, using your creativity, um, be, using your vulnerability. And for me, I think that's how I evolve as an artist. I use my vulnerability to create the sounds and the pieces that. I have so that I can really display, um, you know, what it is I'm trying to convey or what it is I want you to feel. You know, we can feel things we, by seeing them, but it's another thing to close your eyes and actually hear it. And so I, I use my work in that way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you guys so much. Um, so much wisdom and, and, and power and, and what you guys are saying. And, um, I just have to say that that one of the things that I've kind of learned and been grateful for along just my journey, and I, I thank Salam for 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 helping us through this with um, her leadership in um, you know in exploring racial healing for our group is discomfort. Um, I'm so thankful for you know for for being uncomfortable. I'm I'm thankful for that and for you know, um, just sitting, sitting in it and, and just letting it kind of wash over me. And, um, and yeah, so anyway, thank you guys so much for your amazing, um, words. Uh, I want to make sure we get, uh, another round, um, of sharing from you guys. So if you're, you're ready, uh, Salam, you want to start us off? Um, this is a piece that, um, I've read a couple times before, but it's some of um, some years ago. I started doing environmental racism work in rural Alabama, and um, I hope to um, through the Magic City Poetry Festival. Thank you to uh, Ashley Jones and her team, Laura and Alina and others, um, Shantika and all the others who are on the team to do more eco poetry. And part of it, and this is just something about um, North Birmingham. It's called In North Birmingham During Quarantine. In North Birmingham During Quarantine, I can't sleep. We can't sleep. I got a feeling we are going to be here a long, long time. So maybe we should tell the true story of how the fruit trees refused to grow and how the ground turned into stone. How the grocery store Madea bought milk, eggs, sugar, and flour sits empty like an exile underneath a swell of oil. How that oil emits gas and how the odor turns the smell of fresh baked bread into fumes of diesel. In North Birmingham during quarantine. 
How elementary school playgrounds choke six-year-olds as they attempt to sing, if you're happy and you know it. But you better not clap your hands or stomp your feet. Black dynamite from ABC Coke will blast pebbles of death on the soles of small feet. The story of smoky black tar, the deer shelling peas on porches, the feel of hot rain, summer heat, and late spring. In North Birmingham during quarantine, winds chasing rainbows. Then there's Sally. She married Joe, or Joe married Sally. They had four children, a family that sleeps on top of a quilt of dust, dead skin cells as they hug, because hugging is safer than dying, safer than drinking tainted water, poison from rotten pipes, sneaky like the body of a snake, massive, leaky pollution underneath Sally and Joe's Blue North Birmingham's house. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Salem. Um, Man, I just really, it made me miss being in the room with a bunch of Birmingham poets and hearing, <laughs> hearing the poetry happen. But I'm glad we're virtual now. Let's not get that twisted. We need to be away from each other. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to read um, a piece that actually was published today um, by the Academy of American Poets. And um, this poem, I think, speaks to racial healing as I see it, um, because it talks about an issue that I think is really blocking our country from actually healing from its wounds, which is blaming the South for every bad racial thing or educational thing for that matter um, that has ever happened. Um, and this weird idea that somehow racism, discrimination, all that stuff doesn't exist above the Mason Dixon line. It's just not true. Um, so this poem is called, All Y'all Really From Alabama and it has an epigraph from Dr. King. The straitjackets of race prejudice and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. The subtle psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror and open brutality of the South. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., why we can't wait. This here, the cradle, of this here nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back south. Every vein filled with red dirt, blood, cotton. We the dirty words you spit out your mouth. Mason Dixon is an imagined line. You can theorize it or wish it real, but it's the same old ghost, see-through, benign. All y'all from Alabama, we the wheel turning cotton to make the nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built from death. No longitude or latitude disproves the truth of founding fathers' sacred oath. We hold these truths like dark snuff in our jaw. Black oppression's not happenstance, it's law. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. All right, and so I'm going to go to the um, track that I was telling you about earlier with Pat Parker, um, one of the things I didn't mention is that the type of music um, that I use in my work, um, sometimes it's kind of hard for me to label <laughs> what my style is. I always call it like cosmic soul, boom bap, spacey something, whatever, um, right? But it's all, it's all a foundation, um, or lean on the foundation of hip hop. Um, when you think about the values of hip hop and one of the things we teach youth in the, at the Initiative for Creative Arts, that hip hop's core values have always been about respect, peace, self-worth and social justice. Um, and so that's where I lean. That's Bolo, by the way, everybody. <laughs> that's where I lean in, in my work. So that piece about Pat Park, it goes exactly with, um, with Ashley and Salam. And so when I play it, kind of want you to, Listen to the chorus, how I play the chords, the drums, her voice, like all of that, how it, you know, it goes and creates a, a particular emotion and how it's feeling based on reading her work. So hold on, let me see if I can get it for Where you. Where will you be when they come? 
They will not come a mob rolling through the streets, but quickly and quietly move into our homes to remove the evil, the queerness, the faggotry from their midst. Okay, so first off, uh, that was the wrong part. That was her voice, though. And so let me try to let me try to pull that up. Um, can we go to another segment while I um, try to pull up that particular piece? Because I do want you to, I really want you to hear that. Yeah. So Renee, just let us know when you're when you're ready. Um, but I want to uh, open it up to see if anybody had any questions for any of our guests. While Renee's working on that. If not, I wanted to ask Ashley about her. Um, I know you've got a new um, book of poetry coming out. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so my new book is called Reparations Now. And it'll be out in October 2021 from Hub City Press. Um, and they're based in South Carolina, all female run press, which we love. Um, <laughs> and that book obviously talks about the reparations that we all know about, um, which is some sort of compensation to um, black people in America because of all of the um, ooh, injustices, I guess, to say it nicely, <laughs> that have been done to us. Um, but the book also explores reparations in um, a personal sense. Um, it's not just, you know, I want repayment, which doesn't just mean money, by the way. Like, there's lots of different things that I feel um, we are owed as people who have been terrorized in this country. Um, but it also looks at reparations on a personal level. So there's some poems in there about um, ways that personal relationships have made me feel like you stole something from me and I'd like it back, whether it's my time or my care, um, looking specifically at certain men um, <laughs> stolen things from me. Um, but it, it just explores those sorts of feelings of um, trying to reclaim um, what is ours. Thank you. Um, Renee, how are you doing? Are we ready? We're ready to go. Okay. You know what? This, something doesn't want me to play this song for some reason, but I'm, I'm playing it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's going to get played. It's going to get played. Okay, so take a listen. We'll see. Told you. <laughs> they don't want me to play it. I'm about to play this. There we go. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we got to, to hear that. Me too. Me too. Um, <laughs> Um, I know we do. We have a question um, from Crystal. Crystal, can you? Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes, I'm going to opt to stay off camera. I've been feeling a little under the weather today. Thank you all for this space. Um, I have a question um, just for the panel of artists. Something I'm wondering how you all have navigated, particularly in this um, climate, mixed spaces in some of the dialogue that comes up around racial injustice and a lot of the things going on. Um, I'm an applied theater practitioner, and I know in my work and even being in other spaces, a lot of harm, um, especially when dialogue is going done, um, Black people and people of color in general end up being re traumatized. So I'm just curious as to how you all have created those spaces and just navigated some of the things that inevitably come up. Okay. Well, hey, Crystal. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> Good to hear your voice. I know. <laughs> She's awesome. She should be on the panel talking about theater and racial justice and all that other stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's what she does. So I'm like, okay, you know, girl, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I struggled. I've had a challenge navigating spaces and, you know, uh, to be honest. So I've been uh, kind of, uh, and then of course, I mean, it's, it's this time we have, have some separation in those spaces. Um, but I think like um, Ashley mentioned, like if you hear her, uh, her art, her poetry, and it makes you uncomfortable, well then hell, how uncomfortable you think she is when she has <laughs> um, imagining this, this, this poetry when the art called her to give it to you. That's where the uncomfortable nature of it really lives right so I think that there is just a, a unfortunately or fortunate or what have you as a black woman I kind of live in that space um, where there's just this uncomfortable nature of how I walk through the world anyway so now that we're now in this space where we're navigating you know um, police brutality navigating uh, racial tensions navigating you know this hope and uh, change world or whatever we're calling it, you know, I've had times where I don't believe it. Like I don't, I'm not believing allies. I'm not believing that, you know, we're going to have the access that everyone else is having. Then at the same time, I'm finding myself wanting to um, actively kind of push away and just stay in my space. I believe the way I've navigated is try to think about self care and how I'm going to heal my own life and myself. I think that's how, as black women, we survive. I, as a black woman, am going to survive. Anything that I have to survive is I'm going to have to pull myself apart from the navigation of, of the world that expects for me to be magical and to, um, you know, uh, to uh, be this, you know, person who comes up and salutes, you know, and then also puts my body in, in harm's way and protects and loves and cares. Um, I think the most radical thing I'm doing now to navigate spaces is figure out how I'm going to take care of myself so I can breathe my own air and be okay with that and giving myself permission to do just that. And hopefully be, I want to write more about that. I want to write more about the access that I have to myself that no one else has access to and gets access to, to navigate through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank wow. you for that. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know I was on my my microphone is on, but I guess I'll go next. Uh, Ceylon just summed it up for me um, as well, because I had found myself, especially in my space um, of doing hip hop. Right. And it's becoming the new thing in education and in schools. And so I, I get a lot of calls from a lot of people, you know, hitting me up who are a lot of people of color specifically asking me certain questions on how to do the work. And I'm like, wait, what? How to do the work? So you're in this field, but you don't know how to do the work, right? So then I found myself saying, okay, well, how about hiring people who know how to do the work so that you don't put yourself in a place where it doesn't come off as, come off as, um, as dishonest and not sincere, and there may be some biases there. And so going back and forth with that, and I found myself trying to, to um, have the answers or trying to help or trying to 
you know, do the work, but that was emotionally draining. So like say long was saying, just stepping back and saying, okay, you know, I don't have to always try to save everything and save everyone because at some point, um, you know, you're going to have to figure this out. You're going to have to actually want to do the work. And if you really want to do the work, you're going to do the research, but most importantly, you're going to look inside of yourself and, um, be honest about maybe those are internal biases that you have because you can't do the work unless unless you get there. And so that's where I find in those spaces where um, particular youth, youth of color, uh, women of color may be tra- traumatized again because there are people who are who are in the field doing the work and not genuine about it. They're in the, they're doing the work or in the field because it's cool. Specifically, when you when you think about hip hop um, and and MC and and uh, spoken word, you find in, in music technology, you find um, a lot of people in those spaces who are not genuine. And so, you know, I had to step back and 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 look at myself as well, and make sure that I'm healing myself. Make sure I'm really thinking about um, you know what it is that I'm doing as well, because you know maybe hey maybe they really do. Um, are coming from a genuine place and, and need the work and need the help. I'm sorry, need the help. But at the same time, I've gotten to a place where I've accepted and become honest with myself. It's not always my place to do the work for others. So, uh, Yeah, I'll just quickly add on to that um, and say being in isolation has helped immensely um, because I don't have to be in these spaces. I can just close, you know, um, all the channels to me and I don't have to talk to anybody except, you know, my mom or my dad or my, you know, siblings about this stuff. Um, but when I have been in, um, these spaces, even before, um, this period of time, um, because in pre COVID I would travel a lot, um, doing reading. So I would be in many rooms, um, and many things would be asked of me because of the nature of my work, but I learned to be very clear, um, with boundaries and to state, like I did earlier, that it is actually not my job to explain everything to everyone. And it's really not my job to explain to somebody how not to oppress me. Um, that's internal work. So I've been trying to really hone in on, okay, everybody needs to take responsibility for themselves. Each of us has the power to turn inward and understand things and research and read and There's so many resources out there now. You really don't have to go to your local neighborhood black person to squeeze all of the knowledge out of them. There's lots of resources. Um, So just being very clear and intentional. Um, And when you feel uncomfortable, but when I feel uncomfortable, I have tried to get okay with saying, hey, I actually can't take this on. Maybe, you know, go to another resource, Um, which can be hard for somebody like me who loves to help. Um, I have to, as the other two panelists said, I have to learn how to help myself because I can't survive if I'm just trying to, you know, be everything for everybody. Oh, thank you. Um, Do y'all have time for one more question? I know we're about out of time, (laughs) but um, Elizabeth has a question and... um, I think that'll be the last one for the evening. Um, Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, um, Renee, um, Ashley, and Salam. I really appreciate your time and your intelligence. And um, Renee, I especially really like that last song. I just (laughs) learned to play the piano and I could hear the chords. And so thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Um, My question, I'm I'm just going to be brave and say I'm I'm scared to ask, but I heard um, on NPR um, a a peace activist, um, an African-American woman peace activist saying that she thought it would be better if um, white people got together and did healing work with other white people and did some of that internal stuff and really looked at themselves and then came back in circles um, of mixed race people. And um, I didn't hear the whole interview. I just heard that snip. And I, um, I hope, I really hope I'm not being inappropriate and I apologize. I am. I just wanted the dope 
on that? Is that just one person's opinion? Is that, what do y'all think about that? That's my question. I think it would be great if um, white people got together and talk to each other. That is fantastic. Please hasten to those meetings. <laughs> um, I think that's fantastic. And even, I actually do want to address um, the fact that you felt uncomfortable saying what you said. I think um, it's really important for us to communicate. That's really important. Um, I've had a couple of people during this time to have a similar, like, oh, I don't know if I should say this. I don't want to offend. And honestly, like, if you're asking something from your heart, like, it's not going to come off as offensive. You know what I mean? Like that shouldn't happen. Um, and so, yeah, I would say definitely talk to each other and figure things out um, and see how y'all can deal with um, whatever it is that the group comes up with as things to deal with. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, Ashley, I think that's awesome. I think that's great. I think it should happen more because what happens is, um, when you're not, when you're in the, in spaces with um, other people of color, what happened is you tend to lean onto them to, you know, solve the problem or do the emotional labor. And so I think it's important that people who are non people of color get together and do the emotional labor for themselves and for each other, and then come back after you have this honest assessment, right? Then come back and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to contribute. This is how I'm going to do my part yeah, it's, it's, instead of leaning on others to do the work. So, yeah, I think that's great. I think absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, yeah, I concur, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you for sharing and being uh, my friend <laughs> and through all of this stuff that we've talked about. But I concur. Absolutely. And I think um, as artists, and, you know, artists of non-color getting together and talking about how, you know, how can they support through their art form and that kind of thing as well, as opposed to saying, let's just, you know, move through, you know, um, you know, spaces and let's get, you know, let, oh, let's get this hip hop beat maker. Let's get this poet who we know who talks about, you know, racial injustice. Let's get this person who is a community activist who uses spoken word. You know, it's like, no, let's first of all, go into your own spaces. Like um, Sean was saying with the emotional labor, then that's something that I think, you know, we could talk a whole lot about too, when it comes to accountability with white people in emotional labor and that kind of thing. But I think there's accountability piece, be accountable to oneself first, then be accountable to the people who you're close, close, close to the issue that can really help solve that issue before we bring it to the issue of the people who are either oppressed, suppressed, or who may become oppressed or suppressed or re-traumatized as a result of that, I think. All right. Thank you. Um, well, thank you guys so much again. Salam, Renee, Ashley, thank you so much for your, being part of this conversation and, and sharing your, your gifts and talents. And again, Salam, thank you so much for, um, for putting this, um, this group of amazing women together. Thank and them for coming. Thank y'all for coming. <laughs> thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us. And um, we'll see you soon. Thanks again. So appreciative of all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> awesome.